Welcome to History for Granite. Join me to explore ancient Egypt. Together, we'll uncover secrets that only stones from antiquity can reveal. Please subscribe to the channel to get notified when new videos are published, and thank you so much for growing the channel. With the newly released images of the Scan Pyramid's North Face Corridor in the Great Pyramid, there is much excitement about further exploration within this magnificent structure. Since we now have proof the Scan Pyramid's muography models empty space within pyramids accurately, there is no reasonable doubt the big void above the Grand Gallery is a real phenomenon. But getting a look inside the big void is not a small challenge. And unlike the North Face Corridor, some drilling would be required if it does not contain an undiscovered access point near the bottom. The most recent Scan Pyramids data about the Big Void, published in 2019, refined its position to between 10 and 15 meters directly above the Grand Gallery. If one was to drill towards it, I think the second highest space above the King's Chamber, named Lady Arbuthnot's Chamber, is the most favorable location to drill from. One could potentially reach the Big Void drilling horizontally in the north wall of this chamber for a distance of about 7 meters. The point of entry would be somewhere close to the floor of the Big Void near the southern wall. I would choose Lady Arbuthnot's chamber instead of the larger and higher Campbell's chamber, because when drilling you would hope to avoid penetrating the chevrons that protect all of the empty spaces below them, including the King's chamber. It's unknown exactly how the ceiling chevrons in Campbell's chamber are seated upon the north and south walls of that space. It's probable the chevrons extend further than what is visible, and thus if you drilled through the wall below them, you might quickly end up hitting a chevron extending in that direction. Seeking access from Lady Arbuthnot's chamber gives a smaller margin of error for drilling at the right elevation. However, if the big void angles downwards, it just means needing to drill slightly farther to penetrate through its floor. Also, accessing the floor of a hidden space is ideal for sending in endoscopes or robots to conduct further exploration. You wouldn't want to probe for access to the big void from Nelson's chamber or below, because those spaces use granite instead of limestone for their walls. It would also reduce your probability of finding the shortest access point. And lastly, great care would still be needed in Lady Arbuthnot's chamber, because it contains original builder's marks on many sections of its walls that must be preserved. But let's not fool ourselves. The Ministry of Antiquities and Tourism isn't going to be drilling for the Big Void anytime soon. So perhaps this is a good opportunity to reevaluate the last time the Great Pyramid received an invasive drilling in September of 1986. This exploration occurred in the western wall of the horizontal corridor leading to the Queen's Chamber. The drilling was overseen by researchers Gilles Dormian and Jean-Patrice Godin, and they published a book about it in 1987 titled The New Mysteries of the Great Pyramid. Unfortunately, this book was only published in French over 35 years ago, and so many of its lessons are easily forgotten. The only thing people remember is that the three drill cores found nothing of interest except the final and deepest drill hit a pocket of sand. Notably, the sand extended for at least 40 centimeters at the end of a drilling depth of 2.65 meters. Dormian writes, due to a lack of time, drilling did not find how deep the sand cavity extended. It's quite remarkable the sand within this cavity is a large-grained, pure quartz variety not native to the Giza Plateau. Since nobody in Egyptology has attempted to explain this anomaly, I will give you my solution in a future video. Dormian and Godin anticipated finding sealed storerooms in the masonry where they drilled, modeled after early dynastic tombs including the unfinished pyramid of Sekhemket. In my opinion, this was never a likely outcome, based upon the previous pyramids of Snefru containing no such features. The discovery of sand by comparison was considered a failure, and Zahi Hawass, who became director general of the Giza monuments in 1987, denied Gilles Dormian permission to investigate other areas of the Great Pyramid in the decades to follow. But while this infamous sand was a dead end in 1986, advancements in robotics from the past few years bring enormous opportunity to this mysterious cavity. 
The Hawks Lab Department of Mechanical Engineering at UC Santa Barbara has made huge advancements in soft-bodied robots that can tunnel through sand and squeeze through small spaces. These ingenious robots are powered by compressed air and mimic the biomechanical properties of living creatures. Thus, the resistive forces of sand are reduced instead of acted against. The advantages to this approach are almost unbelievable. Because the robot grows from the tip, there is no friction between the sides of the robot and its environment, no matter the length or shape of its path. Another principle the robot uses is air fluidization of the sand. The air blowing from the tip of the robot excavates the sand in front of it, and also locally fluidizes sand, which further reduces resistance. The robot is steerable, using a combination of pull tendons and multiple air streams. This steering control works both vertically and horizontally. A small wireless camera can be mounted on the tip using the internal pressurized frame of the robot body. Just add a light source, and now you've got the ability to completely investigate a sand-filled cavity of the Great Pyramid. This technology has already proven itself for archaeological use. An ancient temple in the mountains of Peru contains small underground shafts which were easily explored using this type of robot. It might seem obvious to use this robot within the North Face Corridor, and I agree that is a favorable idea. But perhaps the horizontal corridor is a better place to start, because absolutely no damage to the pyramid is required to begin this work. The Ministry of Antiquities seemed very proud the North Face Corridor was viewed without excavation, and this could be an opportunity for a similar achievement. And no matter what the sand-filled cavity might reveal, this would be a great story for Egypt. Taking what was once considered a failure and turning it into an opportunity to show the world that the Great Pyramid still contains fascinating mysteries. Lastly, the cost of this technology is almost negligible. Egypt could easily end up spending more money on a press event announcing the findings than the amount spent on the mission itself. Now, let's talk about why the North Face Corridor makes investigating the space even more promising than before. The reason Dormian chose this location in 1986 was microgravimetry scans indicated a significantly lower density in an area just west of the horizontal corridor. But as I've mentioned in other videos, microgravimetry isn't ideal for scanning pyramids because the density of the pyramid is inconsistent. The horizontal corridor leading to the Queen's Chamber has non-staggered joints, the only example of this design used within an Old Kingdom pyramid. That anomaly, combined with the microgravimetry data available in 1986, led Dormian to believe it was the most likely place to find an undiscovered structure. Shortly after Dormian's mission ended, a Japanese team from Waseda University, led by Sakuji Yoshimura, used ground-penetrating radar to further investigate many structures at Giza. Their findings published in 1988 state electromagnetic waves were strongly reflected 4 and 5 meters west of the horizontal corridor. These reflections started 1 meter beyond the Queen's Chamber wall and ended approximately 30 meters due north, forming a short passage parallel to the horizontal corridor. At the time Dormian was relieved to gain additional data validating his decision to drill, but in his 2004 book The Chamber of Cheops, he abandons that location as a potential point of interest. Dormian writes that another georadar survey was conducted in the year 2000 by Jean-Pierre Baron, and that no structural variation was revealed with those tests. I've never found any documentation for Baron's radar survey, so if anyone watching has information, please do share so we can better evaluate this mystery of the Great Pyramid. Given that Dormian conclusively found sand in the area of a hypothetical passage, there's clearly something interesting going on there. We shouldn't dismiss the potential for discovery because one geophysicist couldn't detect anything 23 years ago. Architect Jean-Pierre Houdin interpreted this potential empty space as a second access point to the Queen's Chamber, originating from the newly discovered North Face Corridor above the pyramid entrance. While I don't share Udan's interpretation for the purpose of those empty spaces, they are clearly converging on each other at a level 40 meters above the base of the Great Pyramid. 
Shieldormian formed a revised hypothesis in 2004 that a hidden chamber exists below the Queen's chamber, and he spent a great deal of effort scanning the chamber floor to support that idea. But Scan Pyramids has not detected any voids in that location, so I don't consider it a serious possibility. One observation Dormian made that I have always struggled with is the layout of the floor blocks in the horizontal corridor. In the northern half of this passage, the floor stones are conspicuously narrow, as if the corridor was originally twice as wide. The only other 2 meter wide passage in any pyramid is the Grand Gallery, which sits directly above it. However, the north face corridor is also 2 meters wide, and so now we have another interesting connection between all of these spaces. It's safe to say the potential for making a huge discovery about the Great Pyramid is increasing with each new piece of information that connects these areas. All the more reason to send in non-destructive robots that might get us close to a real solution. Circling back to the big void, there are a few lessons from Dormian's drilling that need to be emphasized. The main reason Dormian had so much difficulty with his drills is that they were required to not use water, which greatly reduces heat and friction. This may have also required larger drill cores than would be ideal. The reason for this decision was if drilling penetrated an empty space, a bit of water might foul up hidden treasures or papyrus scrolls. But with the casing stones of the pyramid now removed, rainwater has been seeping through the joints of the Great Pyramid for many hundreds of years. The water stains on the ceiling of the Grand Gallery are a testament that such precautions are not warranted when probing the big void above. For those of you expecting a hidden space in the Great Pyramid to be completely protected, I'm sorry that such a scenario is unlikely. But it may be that large chevron blocks are quite effective at diverting rainwater away from the space underneath them, just as they do with the pressure from above. This makes me think the big void is less likely to have a gabled ceiling, and therefore probably similar to the corbelled design of the Grand Gallery. You can't call that design a weight-relieving chamber, unless you think there are Grand Galleries all the way down. It's now time for Egypt to start taking the big void seriously. The void is not a noise echo, nor a masonry gap. It's a critical feature of humanity's greatest ancient construction. I totally understand a reluctance to attack the problem head-on, as the pyramid is precious and worthy of the utmost care. So, if 7 meters of drilling is considered too risky, there are alternative methods of investigation to determine if a better course of action is available. There is potentially 30 meters of a sand-filled cavity waiting for us to look inside, and not even a fleck of stone need be damaged to probe this area. Maybe we'll get really lucky, and it will find a path closer to the North Face Corridor, or even the Big Void. What a great story for Egypt, showing that apparent failure can be transformed into enormous success. At the press event for the North Face Corridor, I noticed messaging from the Ministry of Antiquities and Tourism was a bit old-fashioned. Floating the idea of discovering Khufu's hidden burial sets up future investigations for failure, and is also ignorant about what kind of stories attract public interest. A hidden burial, in of itself, is not that interesting. This is why the more extravagant burial find of Pharaoh Susenes I remains mostly obscure in compared to Howard Carter's discovery of Tutankhamun. It was the story of Carter's perseverance and struggle to find the tomb that made it a memorable tale. There's something so captivating about knowing what you're looking for and just barely managing to reach that goal. While Carter did sneak a peek through this wall before the official opening, the public was able to participate in the experience with extensive press coverage at all stages of the expedition. The lesson here is that the journey towards discovery can be far more important than the destination. In that context, Egypt should seize upon the opportunity to make exploring the Great Pyramid a story of overcoming adversity rather than validating anyone's personal theories about the structure. This way, everyone gets to participate in the thrill of the chase, and Egypt will have another amazing story which will attract more tourism than any museum exhibit. We can all relate to the excitement of looking a little farther than anyone else has ever before. Thanks to everyone who watched this video to the end. Please subscribe to the channel to see more of this content. Give a like or comment as you see fit, 
And above all, remember to ask your friends if they take their history for granted.